Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of At Home with Mark. Today uh, is episode 14 of season two. And uh, Scott, thank you so much for making the time. I've got Scott McKeon all the way from across the pond. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. It's funny. I was doing some math yesterday morning and I was like, I just had the, like my 40th show. So you're 41 um, since last August. And I was like, holy crap, man, this has flown by so fast. Like, has this crazy year for you? Has it just like flown by? Yeah. Or does it feel like I mean, it's dragging? <laughs> no, it's, it's going really quick. And um, maybe the first few weeks of when, you know, the COVID thing all started happening last year. It was about this time last year, wasn't it? It all started kicking off. Mm -hmm. That was that was a really surreal time. So that kind of stands out, you know, watching the whole world come to a standstill. But um, yeah, the the last few weeks and months have just gone. You know, it's just yeah. like I can't I can't believe it's like oh we're at Saturday again. How did that happen? You know, I know. Um, so it, yeah, it's it's just I don't know. Yeah, the last year feels like it's just flown by, and I don't know. It's 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 cheesy to say, it, isn't it? But it is. It is a weird time. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. it's you were supposed straight... to, were you supposed to be on tour? You said with Tom Jones, um, but like, was that supposed to kick off in March of last year? Uh, yeah, like April, May of last year. So um, that was like a three month uh, European tour uh, that was due to happen, which got cancelled. Well, I think it's been postponed till this year, but we're yet to find out if that's going to happen i guess everyone's in the same boat a bit things just keep getting pushed back and pushed back so yeah, yeah that would have been i've that that tour the sort of summer tour that we do with tom i've done that maybe sort of five years in a row so it's kind mm -hmm. of um it was yeah the first summer that i've had not not sort of touring around with tom for a little while so nice yeah that's gotta be a fun gig to be on that stage man how many brawls have you been hitting the head with <laughs> yeah <laughs> not not personally hit but the ped my pedal boards um had a few bras and knickers and stuff that <laughs> made managed to make it all the way from the audience to the to my wire pedal or something but um oh man yeah so it's killer cool. i mean tom is an amazing person and an amazing singer obviously it goes goes without saying but he's he's such a powerhouse he's a real like uh, like kind of old old school entertainer so he he he's got all this like history and heritage of performing so being stood next to him or behind him as he's performing and singing it's just incredible because he's just got this powerful voice that resonates from through you know you're playing like a big arena or outdoor festival or something and and his voice just resonates you know he yeah. just pro projects forward and and then just getting to kind of hang out with him as well and listen to all the old stories about you know when he hung out with elvis and little richard mm. and all, the, all these people that he's you know meeting sinatra and stuff and it, yeah I, I really enjoyed like kind of going out for dinner with him and the band and just kind of listening to all those old, old stories but yeah it's, it's been an amazing um few years of playing with him and and getting to tour the world and Get, you know going around the world on a private jet and getting looked after <laughs> you know all of that stuff you know it definitely makes it harder when you when you come home and you do some of your own gigs and you're back in the transit <laughs> transit van and loading your own gear you know? are the posh gigs like the the tom jones gig does that make it easier does that make it less of a grind or does it still feel like a grind when you're a touring musician like that well I think whatever you're doing you've got to get from a to b and and you, there's times when you're tired and you're you know you get it's hard, it's hard to sometimes keep in a good headspace on tour because you're um you know you're you're just doing you're with the same group of people a lot and you're traveling and even though it's in first class sort of style a lot of the time with someone like tom um you find you you, you know you still just get tired and you find yourself whinging about things and you have to sort of like remind yourself how, how lucky you are you know it's, yes. Yeah, there's some silly things that you find yourself going, oh, <laughs> you're like, you know, this is pretty good. You know, everything's fine. I, I actually sometimes on the Tom playing with Tom and, and touring in that way, you end up having a lot more time on your hands because, um, for instance, when you do your own gigs, you can go to the sound check, plug in, fiddle, have a play, mm -hmm. mess around with the new pedal, you know, all of that stuff, jam, you know. But when you're playing, um, doing a gig, 
you know, playing with Tom, you're kind of removed from that. It's almost like you're not, um, you're not allowed to really, I mean, you could go on stage and play in the sound check, but you know, there's a lot of other people to think about. So you can't just go and like turn your amp up and blaze, right. <laughs> blaze some licks for two hours, you know? So yeah. you, I just find myself getting, um, on the downtime, just getting a little bit bored sometimes if you, if you have to kind of make an effort to like go out and do something or go for a walk or go out for, find something else to do because there's just a lot more downtime yeah when you're driving yourself around in a, in right. a van you know? I, i've heard that a lot of uh, my friends who are touring musicians talk about like the hurry up and wait type of yeah. thing you know oh, there's, like, there's always so yeah somewhere to be you, got, you can't do this can't do that you know it's there's a lot of you know um yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you haven't got, got as you much guys time. like do you guys like, does Tom like write like a set list and then you just guys, you dial that in and that's what you're doing the whole tour kind of thing? Or does he throw in different tunes here and there every night or? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty much like you rehearse and Tom and his, his son, Mark, who's um, Tom's manager as well. To, Mark's very hands on. So Mark's like a real um, music nut. He knows so much about old blues and gospel and, and so does Tom. So they'll kind of in the rehearsals, you'll, you'll, you'll end up trying quite a lot of different things and then mm -hmm. it kind of gets refined. So maybe the first couple of gigs that's settling in, but yeah, it kind of stays the same throughout the tour. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think on the last tour, we kept, we, Tom wanted to do a different rock and roll number each night. So we'd do like a, a heartbreak hotel or like a Jerry Lee Lewis song or something like a different one nice. each night. So that, that was kind of cool to mix it up. But um, yeah. And I love all that stuff. So for me, it's I, I i grew up being into like rock and roll because of my dad so tom's main love is is probably rock and roll you know like jerry lee lewis and stuff like that so yeah i kind of all, all of those songs when i hear them just remind me of being a kid you know like growing mm -hmm. up around that that sort of stuff that's a perfect segue because i want to talk yeah. about that um so first and foremost i got to give props here's my buddy chris he's the one that was like you, you got to get scott on the show and uh, I was telling Chris, I was telling Scott before, when you said that, I it, like Scott's name resonated. And I was like, why do I know that name? And then I realized that a band that he's in, the Rufus Black Band, is like been one of my discoveries from like 2016. I think the the first thing I cool. saw of you guys was the um, the video when you guys were doing It's Your Thing. Oh, yeah. And I was yeah. like, holy bleep. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was like, this band sounds so tight. And like Gavin's voice is one of the best voices in rock yeah. and roll. I mean, he sounds yeah. like every single one of my favorite singers mashed into one. You know what I mean? Like yeah. from Joe Cocker to whoever, all in one. Um, and I just, it, it, it really hit is. me so hard, man, when I heard you guys play for the first time. Because it really, it brought me into like this world of uh, like West Coast Boogaloo funk kind of stuff you know like gray boy all-stars and stuff like that where um i grew up that's what i cut my teeth on when i was learning funk music and and all that so anyway we can talk about that band in a little bit but i want to go back to the beginning so i usually ask everybody i have a very specific moment where it uh, entered my life like music entered my life and guitar so you say you, you know your dad was very influential playing music in the house and stuff like how did it evolve for you well, there was there was quite a specific point. Um, pr prior to that, I mean, I was I was very young when I started playing. I was like probably like four or something when um, wow I first had a guitar, four or five. And my dad, my dad used to play um, in this in the early sixties, um, and he he was a very good guitarist and musician. You know, he had a, a good ear and. Just in the, you know, he could just play. He 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 could have been a guitarist, I'm sure, but his he ended up sort of following a different path. And then when I came along, there was only one guitar in the house. It was like a Spanish guitar. That was the only guitar he kept from back in the day, and that was just always around. So that you know, my dad would get it out every now and then, and I'd sort of play along. And I used to have like a little ukulele, and I can remember just loving the guitar and the way it looked, it just seemed to be like, it just seemed to fit. Like it's a, whenever I saw a guitar or think about it, it just reminds me of my dad because it just, it's very neat and tidy and the way it looks and the six strings is watching his hands on the fretboard. So I can't really remember a time when I didn't play guitar because there was always 
something, some form of gu guitar or ukulele or something around. And there's pictures of me when I'm probably about three with a little ukulele and my dad's playing in the garden and we're kind of jam <laughs> jamming. And even though I, I, I don't think I was playing anything, it's like, you know, it goes back that, that far. Um, anyway, when I was a kid, there was this Buddy Holly music. My dad was very into Buddy Holly and rock and roll and stuff like that. And there was a musical version of it, like a West End, um, uh, like a West End show. And it came to our town and we went to go see it. Um, and he was playing a Strat, you know, he had the Buddy, he looked he dressed up like Buddy Holly. And I remember coming away that night, like with my parents and uh, I was just obsessed. I was just like, I want to play guitar, I want to play, you know, I want to, so I think I, I even got the glasses as well at some yeah, point. Man. I had these like thick rim glasses and uh, my dad bought me for like my fifth or sixth uh, Christmas, I guess. He, um, he got hold of like a Japanese Strat, like a Fender Strat. Buddy Holly style two tone sunburst and yeah, so I, I properly started playing about then when I was like five or six and Man. I used to used to go out and do little gigs and I was kind of like a little child prodigy. I was on like a few TV things when I was like seven playing, yeah. you know, like play, and, and it was cool because it was a full size strap, so I'd go out and play like Johnny Be Good or something on this guitar and and it, and it just kept. I can't even remember how I sort of learn really because I, maybe as well when you're a kid you just pick up things so you just you, you, you're kind of like a sponge when you're that age you just kind mm -hmm. of but it, it was very natural and that was that was the kind of pinnacle point of start loving music was around like five or six when i when i saw the buddy holly playing and that was and yeah. i still i've got a poster of a picture of buddy holly on my wall in my studio and i still look at that and i see the strap and see him playing it and it just makes me want to play you know yeah. it just it, i just sort of, that image and I, I think that was probably the same for i guess for a lot of people of my dad's generation that saw that mm -hmm. come, coming through in the the 50s and the 60s like when you see interviews with like uh, i don't know rock stars of that era like dave gilmore and mark Knopfler. i think they all they all had that image of uh, Buddy Holly playing the Strat, and that was it's just such an inspiring sort of thing, you know. Yeah, like, I guess he was like one of the first rock stars, I guess. You know, probably. Yeah, I mean that would make sense. You know, that yeah. time, and that's when things were cooking. You know, starting to pick up. Yeah. Um, so you never really had to. So were records your teacher? Like, did you ever like study formally with a teacher and stuff, or uh, yeah, was it just like in you? Um. I think my dad kind of made sure it was sort of like in me from a young age. So there was, he was always playing stuff and pointing out, you know, why that particular guitar lick sounds cool or how he got that sound, <laughs> awesome. you know? So like, we'd just be in the car or something going on a family trip, but there'd be a Buddy Holly song playing and he'd talk about how it was maybe, oh yeah, he's using a capo on that would be the day to get that guitar sound, you know? And so he was always very specific about the details of things. Um, it's so great, man. Yeah. I do the same thing with my daughter. <clears throat> when we drive around yeah. and talk about music, she's really she's a singer and she's starting to get into piano a lot more. Cool. And uh, we we talk about that stuff. And you know, of course, it's like, Phew! but I'm like hoping yeah. it's by osmosis being around it and stuff. It starts to get in. You know what yeah. I mean? It sounds like I that's what happened does. for you. I did. I did have some lessons at school. There was a teacher, uh, Morris Olbin, who I think is still around, um, and he he kind of taught me like some Spanish stuff. Um, you know, like kind of classical guitar. Mm -hmm. um, but I just remember the sheet music would be in front of me, but I would never read it. I'd, I'd get him to play the, the thing, you know, like green sleeves or something, and he'd play it, and then I'd just copy it by ear and pretend yeah. to read the, the dots. So I kind of always, I was always quicker at just kind of like hearing it and going, oh, I think that's that, and copying it and watching, watching someone do something as well and just copy it rather than, sort of i've never been particularly well schooled in technique or anything like that so mm -hmm. but yeah i kind of wish I, looking back on it i was like oh, i wish i had learned to read music because it would probably make some things easier it's especially like communicating things with other people or someone telling you something you know i, was, I would, well, would like to know i mean yes and no i mean i feel like you <laughs> I feel like you, it's never too late. I mean, you could buy a real book and start shedding every day for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? And it's, it, yeah, 
it kind of comes in. I never have been a great sight reader, and I don't think many guitar players are great sight readers. But there is something about like doing it for ten minutes a day to mm -hmm. like get you in that headspace that does communicate well into like a live setting. You know what I mean? But yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's too much effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so Buddy Holly must have been a gateway drug into, you know, I guess jimmy and stevie and all the players that you now totally. really embrace so like what tell me like so where did it go from there it probably didn't immediately jump from buddy holly to stevie or jimmy but like give me a little bit of like the records that kind of led to that like what was the stuff you were listening to that got you to where you yeah. are now well there was a, a bit like that that moment of seeing buddy holly there was a similar thing with i, I was a little bit older maybe like 10 or 11 and i think my interest in, in guitar had kind of you know, I was just a kid, really, so sort of lost a little bit of interest for a while there. And my dad was kind of always on the lookout for the next thing. So he'd always be, he he was always hanging out in like guitar shops and music shops, chatting to people. And, you know, someone would give give you like an album like Robin Ford or something or Eric Johnson. And then sooner or later, a family friend showed us a video of um, Steve Ray Vaughan and I've, I've told this story before, but I literally, it was a video, it was from a tribute to Steve Ray Vaughan. It was that video, that DVD or whatever. And um, there they were, it was lots of interviews with like his brother, Jimmy and Bonnie Ray and Buddy Guy and people talking mm -hmm. about Stevie. So that that is, I think the show starts like that. So you hear, you know, Robert Cray and BB King and they're like talking, saying how powerful he was and what an amazing guitarist he was and their relationship with him and then it cuts to him playing uh tightrope mm -hmm. it cut it like from austin C city limits like it cuts to the solo and he just launches you know launched into this like thing and i'd never really heard anything like that before um and i just i, I was just like and my dad as well we just sort of sat there kind of like open mouth like what is this this is <laughs> fucking amazing like it was just because it was kind of like it sort of had you know he was playing a strat and he was from texas so it had that kind of you know i i, I kind of knew about that world even as a kid and he was playing bluesy but it's kind of like rock and roll you know it's that it's a similar sort of thing mm -hmm. and it, I, I was just like blown away uh, absolutely just it's, i mean literally like the next day it was um you know went and bought some of his CDs with my dad and we sort of suddenly, suddenly he sort of seemed to appear everywhere as well. Everywhere we looked, it was like, <laughs> it was, you know, he was on the cover of like a guitar magazine. You're like, wow. And it's like all these interviews with him and learning about his life and, you know, how it got cut short and this sort of tragic figure when he was on drugs and then got off drugs. And just the whole thing was just, uh, yeah, really sort of moving. And that whole scene that, um, he was a part of in, in Austin, the kind of, you know, with his brother and all the other players kind of associated with that. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was literally like overnight. I, be, I became like obsessed with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <thing. laughs> Understandably, man. Yeah. There's like a common thread that runs, I feel like with many. So like talking to, you know, Jesse Davey and, yeah. you know, uh, like Eli or whoever, um everybody says the first time they heard stevie it's like i'd never heard anything like that that's just, that's the yeah. common thread that runs through and it's so true man like you know there's a lot of great blues players and you know that and i'm sure yeah. you've studied all the three king stuff and all that but it's like there's nothing like what he came out with there's nothing like it like well, I, the I aggression think it was, yeah it was yeah. i mean he he was i mean i think soon after that i watched um we got on video like the the elma combo thing mm -hmm. which was like even you know it was just really full on from like the, the first note and and i think it was that because you know there's lots of people that play guitar and and they're amazing but there was something about the energy that stevie had and just the sheer sort of aggression in which like you say in which he played and the sort of package in which it came in you know the sort of gunslinger cowboy hat and mm -hmm. the boots and the the sound and he's using like fender amps and fender guitars and it was it was just like that whole that whole thing was just really inspiring and like yeah i guess it was his his energy that was just like it just seemed like it just didn't stop you know it's like yeah. he just started playing and this 
I've heard Jimmy Vaughan talk about it. Like, uh, Stevie would like go on stage, and within like a couple of minutes, he'd be like receiving this kind of inspiration to play, you know, and it just sort of poured out. Whereas, yeah. it, like, some guitar players, and one isn't better than the other at all, but like, some players just play like a bit. Start, I guess, like BB King or something, you know, he kind of is more like a conversation, he'll call and response, and he'll play a little bit and then he'll sing and then he'll play a solo and that's incredible as well but with stevie it was just like this onslaught of like have some of this <laughs> yeah it's amazing it's like a fireball rolling yeah. behind indiana jones kind of thing man it's just like coming at you um, yeah is there so for for stevie is there what's what's the stevie riff because here's the thing about stevie and and me as players like I love that stuff. I've never dived into learning Stevie Licks and like learn his approach because I feel like he was so accurate and so fast and just like so clean. Like uh -huh. what is what's like the Stevie Lick that you love if you could play it for us that everybody should know? Oh god. Well this this is a few, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I oh, there's a there's a bunch, but uh... What's like what's like the one that when you first well, got it I'd... under your hands, you were like, Oh, this is it. Well, there's there's kind of like he does a lot of I don't know if you can hear this very well. We can Let's hear it, it yeah. There's like uh you know that kind of that kind of stuff. Like always I mean he he played a bit more um yeah, aggressively <laughs> probably than that. <laughs> but I, I would that was kind of some of the stuff that I learned quite quite early on and then just the kind of open e you know you know that goes like a lot of that sort of stuff really resonated for me because one of the first things i ever learned on guitar was uh the solo for that'll be the day which mm -hmm. is um played with a capo but the essence of it is like which to me is like really close to what stevie was doing you know that mm -hmm. sort of uh so i already kind of knew all that stuff from being into rock and roll and then to hear um stevie do it um you know and maybe he'd put a bit more of a kind of slant on yeah yeah just like those sort of things just resonated with me straight away but i mean oh god i don't know there's so, there's so with stevie there's um I, th I think one thing people assume maybe slightly wrongly is that he was playing aggressively all the time. So I mm -hmm. think sometimes people kind of make too much of a deal of sort of like, you know, kind of, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it, it, I mean, he did have that power and, you know, doing, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he, he was also quite subtle at, at times as well and had a oh, real yeah. fin finesse and, um, like a kind of funkiness to his playing, like his timing was very on it, um, and very, you know, he could he could mess around with that. But I always liked that, you know, he could be quite neat and precise as well as being aggressive and and loud. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know if it, if it came out of one lick. Um, it's hard it's to say what one lick. Would be, yeah, yeah, it's like the swagger and the. Speed, like the speed yeah there's so there's people that i i know that do this well so you do that really well <laughs> jesse davy does that really well um yeah. even john from peach guitars is a hell of a player man yeah um when i've seen him put videos up and i'm just like man i i, I missed that whole time in my youth where i could have been working on that stuff right. i think and i think i got too deep into you know, I, I grew up, I mean, I'm 41. I don't know how old you are, but I, I grew up in the grunge era. So, like, that's what I cut my teeth on playing guitar and learning guitar. And yeah. then it just jumped straight into jam bands. And then it jumped into Wayne Krantz and John Schofield and, like, you know, stuff uh -huh. like that. So, it's like, I missed my chance maybe with it, like, facility-wise. Like, I don't know. I could probably work well, on it. But Yeah, you know. I, th I think sometimes um, a lot of people, the, the Stevie Ray thing is, like, a big... Um, thing among um players so some sometimes it's, it's not that it's a curse or anything like that but sometimes it can be hard to break out of that mindset yeah. i think so if if you've grown up being into the stevie thing and the texas thing 
it's quite hard sometimes to then go and listen or play in another way because, you know, like I love John Schofield, Wayne Krantz and stuff, quite a different approach, um, mm -hmm. a really different approach to, to someone like Stevie. You know, I mean, I think Stevie kind of is about uh, sort of, it's sort of the power of what he's trying to do, you know, like a big guitar sound mm -hmm. and, you know, a few amps on stage and a Leslie and, a big strat sound and you know kind of tuby yeah. whereas it was sometimes like just like a little boxy funky sound can be different but if you come from the stevie ray world i think you you get into this sort of mindset of like it's got to be always big and always powerful and like you know one thing from doing more like session stuff with people is that doesn't always fit you know sometimes mm -hmm. like just kind of being a bit more subtle or a bit more back you know or like you know one of my favorite records is um a donny hathaway live album oh uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is like sac sacred and that's huge, oh, yeah. that's really powerful <clears throat> you know in a, in a again and but you know some of the guitar playing on that is i think it's cornell dupree and you know you can just have just like a really kind of small little chanks and kind of mm -hmm. so, so sometimes the stevie thing it's sort of like you know you just want to be like so, <laughs> like all the time and just like really yeah. big and powerful but i've for me personally i've had to kind of sometimes move away from that which is hard because i love it so much mm -hmm. but sometimes always doing <laughs> that bit. and also like stevie did it if i want to listen to someone playing i i guess i'd rather just you know i don't always want to be trying to do do that thing and i don't really always want to hear other people doing it I'd mm. I'd I'd like to li I'd just listen to Stevie. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Go and watch the source, and and there's certain things that he did. The more I kind of delve back into old blues guys and other other players and stuff, the more you hear what Stevie, what he was listening to. You could hear that in his playing. You know, um, I had I've got the vinyl version of um, Albert King Blues Power, the, like the live album, live live Blues Power. And yes, yeah, amazing. And that slow, slow blues on there, you know, it's like, this is blues power. And it starts and it's like, it was like the extended version of it. So I don't, I think I'd only had, only heard like the slightly edited version of that. And then there was yeah. a, there was a bit where it kind of went um, quiet in the song and he starts kind of going like. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I've heard Stevie do that, I'm sure, on Texas Flood mm. in, in the break. They... And it was like note for note. And I was like, ah, oh, that's where, <laughs> that's where that's he got, where got that. Yeah. And, and you just hear little things like <clears throat> I haven't, it's kind of a shame to say it really, but I, I hadn't listened to loads and loads of um, Albert Collins. And the stuff I had heard was the later kind of stuff. And then I heard, mm. I heard one of his earlier albums and it was like, I think it had Colin's shuffle on there or something. You know. And like, I could, I could really hear where Stevie had taken a lot of stuff from, you know, uh, those mm -hmm. kind of... Like yeah. all that, that kind of phrasing and timing. And, and same with Buddy Guy, same with Hendrix. And, the, you know, you kind of start piecing together like where all these different influences come. And mm -hmm. also how Stevie would do Albert King things, but he did it in a slightly different way to Albert King, you know, different yeah. tuning. He wasn't pulling down. He wasn't playing upside down like Albert. So it sounds a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was, it's always been interesting to me f finding where that person got that thing from and where that, Oh, that came from that, that album or that live thing. Or sometimes I hear like a Hendrix bootleg and can we go, Steve? You must have checked this one out because there's loads of stuff on the, <laughs> the sound, oh, yeah. the, the, the like little licks. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm rambling on about. Uh, no, no, like, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I find it just really interesting, and you know, because I mean, I'm I'm a fan, of Stevie, but like I I haven't been, I didn't dive super down the rabbit hole. I know a lot of his stuff, but you yeah. know, it's interesting to kind of, it is fun to peel back the layers of that onion of like, who did this player listen to? You yeah. Know? I, I constantly find myself doing that. Like if I find something that I really love, yeah, I want to find out the genesis of how that was created, you know? And yeah. I mean, like, because there's well, a lot to learn from that journey. Totally. And, and you hear things and everyone interprets, you know, um, 
I'll try and play a, like a Stevie Ray style lick and that will come out a little bit differently because I can't do what he did, obviously, you know, like no one can. So it comes out just that little bit different. And if you put some of your own thing on there or something else gets, you know, and then I, so I really like hearing, and it's the same for, I think, you know, like drummers or um, any kind of instrumentalist, like you, you have your influences and if, and they kind of go through your filter and then mm -hmm. at some point it comes out as something else and it's all it's always fun just because you can just keep going back and keep going back well mm -hmm. you, know, you watch um steve jordan play drums or something and you and you kind of think wow i love how he does that you know just really simple like you know kind of thing mm -hmm. and then he starts talking about al jackson or like an old al green record or something you know, oh, i'm gonna go and listen to that and you hear hear the original and you're like oh yeah that's like where where that sort of thing came from and then before that it would have been something else you know so i right. think the more you it can only help sometimes just to go back and find out all that shit because yeah know, it, yeah yeah it's like al green with 17 inch hi-hats it's like yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. like uh, crash symbols you know yeah i know i love that sound man i love drummers that play huge hats and huge symbols like um so steve is obviously one of those people but like are you hip to the wood brothers no i didn't don't know them so you know Mineski martin and wood oh yeah so chris wood uh who's the bass player in Mineski martin and wood <coughs> his brother is oliver and um they have a band that's <coughs> like it's like rootsy music it's like it's not anything like mmw at all but it's like they're like one of my favorite bands but the drummer in that band john o'ricks does a similar thing old big old beat up cymbals and big hi-hats and like but it fits so well like the way that yeah. the way that their mix is because they're a trio it just works like perfectly mm -hmm. i love that sound i love that sound um yeah. i wanted to ask you so you know you have your own pedals uh-huh and line yeah. pedals and then we'll, we'll get into your record the new record but so what was your first guitar rig like the first rig you were proud of like what so if amp guitar pedals whatever whatever you had as a as a youngin what was your first well, like real rig this i'm gonna sound like uh <laughs> like i'm showing off and i don't i'm yeah anyway my, because my dad played and he he had good taste let's say in guitars so my one my first rig when i was like 12 i mean i i had like i said i had a japanese strat and i think a reissue basement that was like my first thing but i've always been very lucky with gear so i've, I've had my 62 strat since i was 12 which wow. my dad my dad bought probably for for himself but you know because i i played um it was kind of like my guitar and he being into the stevie ray thing he he got hold of uh he passed away when i was 13 and oh, he, sorry yeah thanks man he he one of the things he left me as a sort of gift when he passed away was of the guitar, but he'd arranged to for a, a 64 vibroverb, blackface vibroverb to be kind of left. So um, I got given that as a gift when, when I was like 13. And I think bef before he passed away, since we knew he was ill with cancer, um, he bought, he kind of went on this mad spree of like buying lots of pedals and, you know, flight cases and, and things to kind of set me up for the future um, oh man that's amazing so i was very very lucky and and my rig when i was 13 and i'd go out after my dad died um go out and do like pub gigs and you know little clubs and stuff and i, I would take out a 62 strat and a 64 vibe reverb in a flight case <laughs> just to the pub um, and i had i had at one point like two or three tube screamers like a full tone wah um you know i had like really amazing stuff that you know um like most 13 year old kids don't don't have so and and i'm but i didn't take it for granted because i it, it meant the world to me and, mm -hmm. and so i i understood the importance of the gear and, and what i had so yeah, it, it, it sounds sort of like a bit, uh, I don't know what the word is, sound like a spoiled kid, but <laughs> I had no, I was man, very I mean, lucky. That, 
Yeah, I was gonna say you're just lucky that you had a, a dad with good taste and yeah. knew what stuff was. Because when I was 12, I didn't know anything about vintage gear. I'm like, you just buy this, you know, guitar that's hanging on the wall in the shop, man. You buy that amp over there, that PV. Yes. You know what I mean? Like that's what I knew when I was 12. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's it's just like you know, super. I mean, you're just lucky, dude. That's all yeah, it is, man. It, it's very cool, and and yeah. So I I kind of. Yeah, I had a, a decent <laughs> setup from quite a young age, which I think probably have, having that guitar, having my 62 from such a young age as well, I think just kind of helped with my playing because it was such a it's such a great guitar mm-hmm. and it gives kind of gives back to you, you know, like some guitars you pick up and they, they're not right for whatever reason or they don't feel right. Whereas this guitar was like, I just shut my eyes and play it and it always kind of helps like you just like it just kind of did something you know it was like mm-hmm. kind of pushing you along you know helping you play and uh, having that kind of connection with it after my dad passed away it became almost a bit of a um like slightly kind of i don't know like a, a bit of a spiritual connection to my dad because it, it was he wasn't around but like having the guitar and it being such a sort of prized possession and each time you played it it was like you know i took it very seriously it was like a connection to him and to that world and so it sort of had this real importance with me from a young age where it's like well when you play you got it's it's got to take you somewhere and it's got to mean something and and it did and it does still to this day if i pick it up it's it's um you know, without getting too kind of airy fairy about it, but it, it's a connection to, to to something that I can't get anywhere else. I can't talk to my dad, or I can't. Um, but he's with you. But, That's he, the but thing. yeah, yeah. When I play music, even just like talking about Stevie Ray, then and picking the guitar and playing some Stevie sort of Pride and Joy or something, that takes me to a really sort of safe place, happy place. That um, you know, like it's it's a bit like um, sometimes like. Well, m- music in general, like you know, like when you sometimes when you smell something and it reminds you of someone, you know, you smell like someone's aftershave. It takes you back to that person. I find music does that like a hundred times more. Like you put on a oh, song, yeah. um, you know, it, that means something to you, that takes you to a place. And really, I think that's what guitar does for me. It, it it's it's never been about like just a technical thing. It's more about it's quite for se- quite selfish reasons. When I play, it just takes me to a a kind of place where I feel like happy and it makes sense and and you can play and it, it's a connection to to my dad and and wherever he is now and it and it and it, all of that stuff without without going too kind of I don't want to make it seem like too kind of um, cheesy or um, anything like that but that's that's really what it's about for me so that that guitar and having that connection you know um, yeah. Yeah, that's not cheesy, Scott, at all. I mean, that I think that, you know, 99.9% of musicians would probably 100% agree with that. I know that I've yeah. been, I don't know if you've ever been on a gig where you felt sick before you stepped on stage. And then when, as soon as you wrap that guitar around your neck, your endorphins kick in and you don't feel yeah. sick at all for the next two hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, there's, yeah. there is something like primal and magical about music i mean that's why i I, you know it's a huge part of my life and always will be that's why i want to give it to my daughter i want her to have that as her you know kind of it shouldn't live in the ether it should live within you know what i mean so but yeah so not cheesy man that was a great story (laughs) um so i want to talk about before because i want to go through the record and run out of time but um so the fuzz pedal so Mm -hmm. the sm fuzz the first that was the first one right and then the octave is coming after that right? right yeah Okay. That's right. What what is that SM fuzz based on? Is it based on a, a pedal that you had previously, like a vintage fuzz face or something like what is that thing based yeah. on? Yeah. So I, I made one um fast forward a few years to when I was like, I don't know, eighteen or something. I made uh a pedal. I like got a schematic off on, online of a fuzz face and I I sort of went and got all the parts and soldered it together and I made this little fuzz fuzz pedal. It was kind of based on a fuzz face, I think. And I used it like loads. I just, it, it was just always, well, I didn't have a pedal board at that point, but it was always my main pedal. Mm-hmm. And it, it sounded pretty cool. It was like just really fuzzy and saturated and 
Um, I used it on my first album a lot. Then I, <clears throat> I did a few gigs like opening for um, like Joe Bonamassa and um, a few other people. And like Joe, for instance, came over. He said, what's that little box you've got on your pedal board? What is that? And I was like, oh, it's a pedal I've made. And he's like, oh, man, you should make one for me and sell them you know and mm -hmm. he was kind of joking about it and a few other people sort of said similar things and then it was a friend of mine in london uh, a guy called luke who he saw the pedal and he was like oh could you make me one and i was like oh, i'm not very i'm not very good at soldering or like electronics but i'll give it a go and he was like well, my uncle makes um designs circuit boards and stuff so we took the the pedal to him my friend's uncle and he kind of copied it and cloned it and we fiddle around and he was like oh, i could maybe you know add a power supply and add a led and you know if you did this the the temperature might not be as if, if it might not affect the pedal as much you know because it's germanium germanium yeah yeah so we, we i think we built like 20 and just to sort of sell to friends and stuff and they just went really quickly <laughs> you yeah. know just from the website and then i was kind of like i'd chat to um like someone like doyle or um Robbie McIntosh and give them a pedal and they're like, oh, we really like this fuzz pedal. It's really cool, you know. That's so it awesome. just kind of, it built from there really. But yes, yeah, essentially it's a germanium fuzz face style pedal with a couple of little tweaks and it's based on my kind of sh shitty one that I made <laughs> in my bedroom. <laughs> I was 18, Dude, but yeah. It sounds immense, man. I told you I really want to try one. I mean, it, it yeah, okay. I love fuzz that's like, sounds like your amp's about to like implode. Like it's yeah. just like, and it seems like it cleans up really good too. Like mm -hmm. your solo in third eye, is that that fuzz pedal and just rolling it back? Like, yeah, so that's, that's the new pedal. Um, so uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we kind of relaunched the original fuzz a few months ago. Um, and the new pedal is designed. It's kind of based a little bit. Do you know the experience pedal? If you had yep. those, they're like, they've got like a, like an octave and a fuzz kind of in one it's loosely kind of based on something like that and then also based on my old roger mayer octavia Woo, yeah, which is really man. cool so that that solo on third eye witness is um the fuzz and the oct oct octavia on and yeah. then it kind of creates this sort of um on the on the new pedal there's a bias control on the fuzz side so you can sort of get it a little bit gated you know it kind of, yeah. sort of goes a bit sort of choppy and and then if you put the Octavia after that on the, you know, you've got both on the same pedal. If you put them both on, it does kind of just sound like the amps on the edge of exploding and yeah. just like this kind Love of it. like nasty sort of sound. And yeah. and it's really cool because it's gated and you've got the Octavia kind of tracks in a weird way. It, you can't really play chords with a, it sounds like a ring modulator or something when you try and play chords. Love it. So yeah, you can just be really percussive and it'll cut in and out and uh yeah. Yeah, man. I'd love it, dude. I, I mean, I own a um, Moger Froger ring modulator because of Wayne Krantz. Oh, yeah. And that thing is so fun. I'm actually, I think I'm going to do a video on it this weekend. I started this video uh, series in my channel called My Like Oddball Pedals in My Collection. Yeah. Stuff that I don't take to every gig because you can't, that's a very specific pedal, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. You don't take that to every gig. But man, I love that sound. My buddy Terry's in here. He does the art for all the at home with Mark stuff. He's he's interested in trying. He's a we're oh, both good. fuzz nerds, like huge fuzz yeah. nerds. Um, well, I, right, love, I was just gonna say I saw Wayne Krantz um, at the fifty five bar a couple of years ago. Yeah, um, it was Josh Dion on on drums. It's one of the, one of the best gigs I've seen. It's like the tiny little place, you know. It's like hole in the wall. Literally yeah. stood like you know a meter away from where he's wayne's playing and um he's just i love his timing like he's just mm -hmm. got this pocket and you, you kind of count in the song like one two three <laughs> like really yeah really quietly and there's just this like pocket to what he's doing and when he starts looping stuff and uh yeah that that i think he was using like an electro harmonics harmonizer or something for that kind of um you know when he does that really weird sound and it's and it's almost like the notes are just going to like it sounds like it's gone through a computer or something, you know, it just goes. Yeah. Dip, I dip, have dip, that dip. pedal. I oh, bought cool. that too, because I didn't want to take the Moger Foger out. Um, oh, right. Is it a similar I did, thing? Yeah. Cause I did an interview with him for Berkeley. Cause I still work for Berkeley a while ago. And we were talking about it. He was like, yeah, I don't like to take it out much of that anymore. So I use this and it gets the job done. 
uh-huh. you know, for what I needed to be, you know, for the ring mod stuff and all that. Yeah. But yeah, dude, have you seen he has a he has like a new metronome app? Have you seen that human humanome? No, I thing? haven't. No, I haven't checked it out yet. But like, apparently, it's a great metronome app. I don't right. know. But anyway, let's talk about the record. So yes, so new morning. So you were gracious enough to send this to me about a month ago mm-hmm. uh, when we booked this, and I freaking love this album. Anybody. As soon as this comes out, if you're a fan of this channel, you will love this album. It is, I was telling Scott, like before the show, how it feels to me. Like when I first listened to it, the first time you sent it to me, I listened and I texted you. I was like, I want to be in your band after listening to this. Cause it's like, I can, I love the sound of it. But, um, I was, I was cooking dinner, listening to it. And I was like, this song sounds like fusion. This song's like blues. <laughs> This feels like a soul live tune. This feels like a yeah. Jeff Beck thing. This feels like just classic rock and roll soul stuff. I oh, cool. love what you did with this record. It's a journey, man. Like from start to finish, it is like so fun to jump on that ride. So like, can you talk to me a little bit about your, cause I'm a songwriter. Can you talk to me about the songwriting process of these tunes? Yeah. I mean, well, thank you. I mean, that's amazing to hear you say that because, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, man. it's <laughs> yeah. a great record, it. dude. It really well, is. Thank you. I mean, a song was. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say they were sort of songs in the classic. Set. I mean, a couple of them are, but they're more. Um, the idea with this was more to like get in the studio and with some of my favorite players and some of the greatest players out there, in my opinion. So it's uh, Jeremy Stacy on drums. Who is, uh, I told you, that drum. <laughs> yeah. The drums on this record, A, sonically sound amazing, but the playing is just stellar. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree. Um, and I, I was a fan of, well, J- Jeremy's playing drums and his twin brother, Paul, produced it. So they, they, they Paul plays guitar as well. And they're a, a kind of musical um, team as well. They, they've done lots of stuff together. Jeremy played in Cheryl Crow's band a lot pool in with the black crows um among others you know like oasis and noel gallagher and um lots of i think their main background is jazz actually so they're kind of jazz they grew up being jazzers and and they're they're both amazing um and uh just quickly i'll just say as well uh, rocco paladino is on bass and mm. gavin from rufus black sings on a few tracks as well but the, the main idea was just to get in a studio and number one like mike like with paul's idea because it was sort of the album came to be and i'm going to name drop here so i apologize but i, I got no, to play with eric, i got to play with eric clapton um at, at, at a charity event and he was really cool and i got to kind of like play alongside him and stuff and i i came away from the gig and i was thinking if if he was going to go online and listen to some of my music what what's out there so I, I chatted to Paul and he was like, well, you should just do an album and you should make it just about the guitar, you know, the guitar front and center and, and do what you do when you play live, which is kind of like, just go off and see what happens, improvise. you know, improvise mm-hmm. and all of those things. So quite soon after that, we got in the studio, this is a couple of years ago now. Um, and he, Paul is not only a great musician, but he's an amazing engineer. So he had his studio is no more at the minute but he had a an amazing studio in london which was like a big old trident desk and lots of old vintage gear and mics and amazing things so he he's got he's like a a hoarder of all this stuff as well Mm -hmm. so when we were choosing a studio it had to be somewhere that was like old school in its in its approach um so we went to a place called rack studios in london which is it's kind of like Abbey Road. It's like a big, famous, old-fashioned recording studio. And his attention to detail with miking things up and making, you know, the room sound great. Um, it, it's just like there's there's not many people that know the amount of, of about gear. And it, he's just got these amazing ears and this amazing vision of what he wanted it to be and what I wanted it to be. So... It was like let's let's get in an amazing room, an amazing studio, with some players, and then let's just see what happens. So there wasn't much thought past mm-hmm. like 
let's just get it. So we, we booked it all in, got together and spent a few days getting the sounds and stuff. And we're all in the same room as well. So that was a, that was a big awesome. part of it. Cause like, you know, all most of my favorite albums, like when you think of like, I don't know, Led Zeppelin one or two and like electric Ladyland and access Boulder's love and pink Floyd stuff. It always sounds like they're kind of in the same room, just playing. Yeah. And you can hear the snare rattle when the, bass player plays something and you can hear you know you hear the sound of the room in there so that was that was the main plan is to like well let's just get in a room and play and there's also this um there's a miles davis album called uh get get up with it i think that's what it's called and they have these kind of like epic you know half an hour songs 20 minute songs <laughs> these jams that just go off on a tangent although i'm not a, uh i'm not really a jazzer in that way i love listening to that sort of stuff and i and jeremy and paul they can just go off you know jeremy can go off on the drums like a jazz drummer would yeah so it was kind of like just trying to get a bit of all of all of that in there um and make it a, make a guitar record that was cool as well like cool sounds and cool drum sounds because sometimes with guitar stuff it's easy for it to become a bit of a nerd fest for <laughs> just it was just being like guitar yeah. nerdy stuff <laughs> look and at I'm me in, yeah yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm into that as well like i love some of that stuff uh, but me too. It, I, I think paul wanted it to be a bit more like not necessarily like soundtracky but just have a bit more like almost tell a story as it goes through it and it kind of moves with emotion and, and uh all of that stuff so yeah the, when it came to actually writing the songs there weren't really it was more like I, i'd have a riff and I, I always play off the drummer generally, so mm -hmm. I was sort of play off Jeremy. And you kind of you could play him anything, um, any sort of riff kind of thing, and he just put a beat on it, or do something that was to maybe totally unexpected or something you wouldn't think of doing, and that would kind of inspire the song. So mm -hmm. the, some some of these were jams, like for instance, um, oh I can't think off the top of my head, but some of them were quite long jams that we kind of cut down, like Crossfader. Um, Crossfader, yeah. So that, that that was a that was a jam that was about half an hour, forty minutes. <laughs> yeah, that, that we like. It's awesome. You know, oh, cool. And you have that language in your hands, like the jazz stuff. Like Jeremy, I, I knew it by listening to it because I could hear him playing over the bar line and and stuff like that. And you have you have that language too. And I can only imagine the reason that this record is so palpable and hit me so hard is because it, it reminds me of. When you have a great drummer like that, like you're saying, that can inspire you to do something different, it, it reminds me of being a kid and being in the basement at band practice. And like, there's no rules, there's yeah. no right or wrong answer. It's all just music kind of thing. That's what this record feels like, but it feels That's so cool. natural. You know, it's like, it's, it's, dude. I mean, that song, so Crossfader, and I told you everything is nothing. That's, that, that's my jam, man. Like, <laughs> the 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 um improvisational section of that is killer but like and gavin's voice is just like mind-blowingly good um yeah he's so amazing. yeah i can't say enough good things about him and it, as a singer myself it's like i'm like God, i wish my voice could do that like he just <laughs> yeah. like people that just have that man it, it's just so good but like you know the the third eye witness groove in the middle there with jeremy i can only imagine that when you guys were recording that and letting it breathe and do its yeah. thing, yeah, there's it, it feels like I was sitting in the room. Like I'm oh, gathering wow. that's what you guys were going for, but like, oh, totally. Know. I mean, that's that's you know, and you mentioned um, like some of those early Jeff Beck albums where and you know Zeppelin things and stuff like that, where it feels like you're in the room as as these kind of moments are happening. I think quite often when you go in to record it's very easy to almost take it too seriously. You know, you're paying for studio time, you've written a song, you know, you want to get the perfect performance, the perfect solo that's punching and out. Key. Whereas like with this, it wasn't like that. It was like, mm -hmm. let's just, you know, have that kind of almost childlike approach to jamming. And mm -hmm. when, you know, you don't often do that um, because it almost feels a bit sort of like, naive risky. or something yeah risky Ooh. like like nothing we could have ended up with nothing basically <laughs> you know we could right. have just and sometimes it felt like we were sort of wasting time because it's like the i think paul's uh although he was engineering there's a 
couple of in-house guys helping him. I think they're thinking, what's going on here? It's like, you know, <laughs> what are these guys doing? You know, they're no, just man. jamming around for, for it's, hours. No, it doesn't come off that way at all either, man. Like, I, it's such a cohesive, you know, piece of, I mean, from start to finish, it's a very cohesive album. And it's, it, like I said, it takes you on a journey because, like, there's so many different vibes. Like, I was just taking notes down um, just about, like, like New Morning to me is the one that I felt felt like a like Krasno and Soul Live type of a vibe to it. Oh, cool! And I mean that as a compliment. I don't I don't mean to be like it sounds exactly like Soul Live because it doesn't sound like it. Just like mm -hmm. that's the like the I don't know like the energy and like the uh, like it was fun fun yeah. to listen to and like some of those like Krasno is one of my favorite guitar players. But like you know it's it, there's just tunes on here. So like. You know, everything is nothing feels like a funk rock tune. Uh -huh. Like Crossfader feels like that jazz fusion meets blues type thing. Like Fight No More feels like Hendrixy to me. You know, like that kind of 70s blues soul rock kind of thing. Like Zapruder feels more like fusiony blues stuff. So it's just like there's oh, cool. so many different vibes on the record. And that's impressive knowing that you guys just got in a room and jammed because you could end up having a record that sounds the same from song to song. Yeah. Everything sounds the same. And yeah. the fact that that didn't happen uh -huh. is even more impressive that you guys managed to come out the other side with like such a like array of tunes. Like it's oh, cool. Wow. Man. Oh, thanks yeah. man. That, that's really cool to hear because um, not many people have heard the album yet. So just to get a bit of feedback um, outside of, you know, the people involved is, it's amazing to, to hear that. And that, what you just said is totally what we were going for. So that's really cool um, that you you picked up on some of that stuff. And I think just trying to, you know, I, I'm not trying to be like a jack of all trades, but just trying to get in some other influences and some other moments. Like I love a lot of jazz stuff, but I don't always feel I have the, um, the kind of know how to go that, you know, like we say about John Schofield or Wayne Krantz and they can just go off on, you know, John Schofield and he, I love his playing. But I kind of I don't feel like versed in that stuff or like bebop or like you know mm -hmm. I wish I did and ho hopefully I'll just keep learning you know as you keep as you do you know you keep trying to like learn new things but no I think a big part of being able to do some some of those other styles is because Jeremy and Paul are jazzers and they can take and the uh, keyboard player Ross they can take it to those other places a little bit. So it's quite, it's quite lazy of me. Cause I can just say, well, just, <laughs> you know, I'll just sit back. <laughs> yeah, you were hanging. You held your own, man. It's yeah, I'll, great. Just, I'll just stay on the route. No, it's fine. I'm just chilling, chilling. Hey man, <laughs> ain't nothing wrong with the triad. Yeah. <laughs> Triads are great. Out of tension. There you go. It's jazz. Play the yeah. wrong note. Play it twice. It's jazz. Yeah. Right. Um, it's a, it's a, I mean, I, again, I don't feel like well versed enough in jazz to be able to talk about it, but I feel like, one of the things is with jazz is just being able to go off and um fearless almost like yeah just not think about what you're playing so you just let it come out and if it's you know this it's sort of occasionally some licks i play on there or hint at or little runs and i think well i don't even know what i was doing there but it's like it's just to me it just it felt right in that moment or reacting to something jeremy was doing or yeah. even just hearing a just a note like that isn't in the blue scale or something and just being able to kind of hint on that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, def definitely, definitely the, I mean, just being in a room with people who uh, are kind of like heavyweights in that, in that way, just, just raises you, your game really. And like makes you, it makes me play better playing with really good people that are inspired and um, can push you into something in, into another place that you didn't know you could, go and and that can be hard to to know if it's the right thing because for me i always reference other music so i'm always like you know i want it to sound like that hendrix thing i've heard or i want it to sound like that stevie ray thing i've heard so when you're just playing and you're not referencing those things it's harder to know if you're playing any good or not because you haven't you, right you, you're not just copying something you know you're trying to like invent something or play something that hasn't not that hasn't been done because that makes it sound a bit sort of like um uh, over the top but like just you, you're just trying to come up with something in that moment 
and um, and it playing off what someone else is doing. And that is that for me, it's been one of the coolest sides of all this. Is like just not relying on your kind of stock stock licks that you've got. You know, mm-hmm. that you're just sort of like, oh, I, I can play this uh, run that I worked out here. Right. And that's cool sometimes, but if if you just kind of like just go off on one and let it let it out that and that record um, and what we did in the recording was really about that. It was like um, mess, messing around and jamming and having having fun <laughs> trying to capture Dude, something. Yeah, it translates well, my friend. I mean, it really does. It's it, you know you can tell when musicians aren't having fun, you know, on a record uh-huh. if it's if it's like a phone in situation and more so. You can really see it at a gig, obviously. Yeah. Dude, I, I'll never forget this last summer. Not last summer because of COVID. Maybe the summer before that, I went to a show uh, to see the Wood Brothers and Lake Street Dive was on the bill as well. And I remember I was like, the one, the guitar player is pissed. Something is, <laughs> something's going on between that yeah. band and that dude. Like he seems Yes. And I remember <laughs> talking to my wife about it. She's like, really? I'm like, look. And then like 10 minutes later, she's like, oh my God. <laughs> like, she's like you could see it. I'm like that. Yeah. And that the audience starts to not have a good time. Yeah. That'll never happen. If you listen to this record, you're always going to have a good time. Cause it feels <laughs> yeah. like when you listen to it, it feels like you guys were smiling the whole time. And like, I bet you, you went back in the control room, listened to the mixes and there was parts that made you guys laugh. It was so good. You know yeah. what I mean? Like well, the, everything connected, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's a big part of it. I think like having fun, I mean, um, Jeremy and Paul and I would include myself in this and, and Rocco and uh, the other people involved, like there's a lot of piss taking and joking around at the same, you know, at the same time, which I think creates a really fun atmosphere to make music in because everything i mean we take music seriously but everything around the music is kind of stupid and pissing about and trying, to make, trying to make someone laugh or saying something really offensive just to you know like just to, just to kind of get a, get a reaction. wake up yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah because all too often like you know sometimes you're doing gigs or sessions or whatever and you know the atmosphere can be quite serious and it doesn't always inspire you but when i think as, as well like I was talking about earlier about taking the recording process too seriously. It's almost like that red light fever thing of like, if you're taking it very seriously, you know, guys, we're going to press record in a minute, you know, one, yeah. two, you know, and it's like, oh, it's, up. yeah. And then I, 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 I always play worse when I think like that, you know, even mm-hmm. if it's just a really simple thing. Um, Me too. Whereas it, yeah, right. It, if, if you've got that, if it's, if, if it's a bit throwaway, Although that seems a bit backwards, it, you can get more out of what you're what you're doing because um, you're not you're not so worried about it, you know. It's, and I, and I feel that with like a lot of like when you listen to Jimmy stuff or like you know, um, it, not that it was throwaway because I'm sure he, did, but I don't think he was analysing it and thinking about it like i'm practicing a lick you know if he played the wind cries merry and they used take number seven or something take number two was probably quite different he probably played a totally different solo or a a different way of playing it so i think one thing is is that is that i wanted to capture like you say was just just to sort of like well that just happened like we could probably Mm. never like that that tune crossfader in particular which has ended up as this kind of um slightly psychedelic kind of jazzy free kind of thing Mm -hmm. that really was just a jam that happened and that was just one part of the jam we faded it in at a certain point so there was 10 minutes previous to that which maybe at some stage we'll see the light light hence hence crossfader yeah hence the crossfader yeah (laughs) that's awesome man but it almost feels i almost feel a bit guilty in, in some ways with with that because uh, well, not guilty, but I guess this this particular album and the way it was done, it that's what it is. We didn't craft. I didn't go in with ten songs, with verses and choruses and middle eights and planned out and demos or anything. There was none of that. It was just like, let's just see what happens. Let's go make some music. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we, and, and maybe it it'd be fun to do that again next time. But maybe next time it would be. I feel like maybe I need to have a few more. <laughs> things ready to ready to go that are a little bit more worked out maybe 
So. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's a great record. You guys all need to check it out. When when is it officially dropping? April the twenty third. Okay. That's when it when it comes. Cool. Out. And it's going to be everywhere, like digital market, your yeah. website. Yeah, okay. it's. Um, there's, there's physical, vinyl for physical. sale pre-order right right now yeah 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 double vinyl um and it's on like the thick 180 gram stuff so Ooh, yeah yeah. I, it's, yeah that's it's, the physical copies are available from my website and the digital stuff will be like you know spotify and apple music and all that but yeah band camps um if you are th thinking about getting it band camps a really good one um just for yeah, the artists, it's, you know, so it for sure, helps, you know, I was going to say buy it directly from, from Scott, if you can. And, and from Bandcamp too, because you, you know, we don't get, we don't get Jack really. If people buy it through iTunes, I mean, it's very, yeah. you know, it's not a good split at all, but um, yeah, things like Spotify and stuff. I kind of have a love hate relationship with, cause it's great for listening to music and finding stuff. And I think people can find your music through Spotify, but yeah, I mean, in terms of, what they pay people i don't know yeah, <laughs> yeah. all right so to wrap this up i don't know if you uh -huh. if you know this i always do a lightning round it's called the lightning round get down it's 10 quick questions okay it is cruising at an altitude of 105 bpm to build some suspense in the background nice it's just some fun questions so i'm gonna hit you with these um you can explain your answers if you want i love hearing explanations as to why you chose that answer Okay. But it's a this or that type of a situation. So, first question is always the same. Lennon or McCartney? McCartney. Germanium or silicon? Oh, it's got to be germanium. Club or theater gigs? Um, I guess club. Yeah, the smaller ones, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Smaller <laughs> clothes. Um, pizza or fish and chips? Uh, oh, pizza. Yeah. Okay. But glass, good pizza. Good, really good pizza. Yeah. Um, glass or a brass slide? Um, I like glass because it's lighter. What finger do you wear your slide on? Um, I guess the ring finger. Ring finger. No, the third, third finger. Have you ever messed with using your pinky at all? Uh, yeah. But I, yeah, I no. Doesn't feel as comfortable. <laughs> it's yeah. tough. Um, Netflix or Disney Plus? Uh, Netflix. Super Reverb or Deluxe? I just got a Deluxe, so I'm going to say Deluxe. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. And as a as a superhuman power, would you ha rather have the ability to freeze time, or would you rather have super strength? Uh, I think freeze time. Okay, that would be that would be handy. So you could just. Well, see, everyone else is frozen, but apart from you. Yeah, and you basically. could take a nap, get caught up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get caught up on your sleep. Superhuman strength. I can't imagine what I'd use that for. Yeah, you don't want to break your guitar, man. You try to play those yeah. Stevie Ray Vic licks and rip your '62 neck off your instrument. Yeah. Um, Lamborghini or Ferrari. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything about cars. Ferrari. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. And then the last question, Scott. So sometimes this is super hard for people. Sometimes it's wicked easy. But if you could pick one album and erase it from your memory, so you've never heard it before, just to be able to experience it for the first time now, what album yeah. would that be? Oh, God. I think maybe something like Off the Wall. Oh, that, that that would be cool to hear for the first time. Okay, okay, yeah. So is that like a you know one of your favorite MJ records? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just yeah, it's in, it's okay. incredible. The the production and the I mean, like Don't Stop Till You Get Enough it has to be. Oh man. I mean, you hear that on any stereo system, like a little Bluetooth speaker or in the car or like in a, you know, not that I go to clubs, but like in a club or something. It's like the best sounding record ever. Yeah, dude. So, yeah. All right. Well, you made it through. You are unscathed thanks. on the other side of this. Um, Scott, dude, thank you so much, man. I, I, I had so many more questions I wanted to ask you and oh. then maybe we could do this another time. But like, yeah, uh, thanks, I really, 
really appreciate you making the time. Super fun to chat. And everybody, for real, once that record drops, go get it. It's so good. Like, get the vinyl. I'm sure that sounds amazing on that 180. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for making time. A bunch of people are in here and uh, appreciate you doing that and stopping by. This will live on the website for in perpetuity. I'll send you the link, Scott, if you want to share it around. But uh, you can hang out for a second, Scott. But you guys, take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you on the flip side.